Hey, what's up everyone? Jukum here, and I'm hatching eggs sent by viewers in a Pokemon White Hardcore Nuzlocke. All of this was streamed on my Twitch, link in the description, smile. If a Pokemon faints, which, why would they ever, father of the year over here, but theoretically, if they do, they're dead and can't be used. Also, I may only hatch an egg for each new area that has available wild or gift Pokemon. As for the hardcore rules of this Nuzlocke, those will be on screen right now. It's important to raise these little tykes correctly, so what better way to do it than use them mercilessly in battle to defeat the various gym leaders of Unifa and stop a half-sympathetic, half-insane cult. Let's get cracking! As my official starter of the run for New Vema Town, our first hatchling is a Diglett, who we name Dirt. She's fragile, but quick, and has final gambit as her egg move. The submission I had for this let a lot of people be trolls in the best ways possible. And for our Route 1 egg, we bring a Slugma into this world called Magma. She's decked out with a 100 base power stab heat wave for her egg move. Pretty great for this point in the game. Also, I picked Snivy for this playthrough, meaning our first gym battle will be against Chili, a much better type matchup than if we were fighting Cress's Panpour. Things are looking bright already. Except, unfortunately, <laughs> where I had left off to hatch Pokemon was right when we would battle N for the first time. Guess who forgot to level up his Pokemon? This guy. N has a level 7 Purloin, and I'm immediately realizing the pay for this caretaking service was not worth it. Heatwave at level 1 can't carry this entirely, and Scratch deals half of Magma's health, but we do have one out. Thanks to some time wasted by Purloin, we get off a yawn to put him to sleep. And then... Y you see... <laughs> Guys, you know what we have to do in this situation? <laughs> you know what we have to do. There's only one thing we can do in this situation. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't even kill. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> I sincerely don't know how to describe this, so I'll just move on. Diglett, with its base 10 HP, didn't even put Purloin into Heatwave range. We'll need a miracle as Purloin stays asleep yet another turn. And that's precisely what happens with a critical hit Heatwave knocking Purloin out and defeating Ed. This not only wins us the battle, but it's our first battle. Oh my god. I skipped several years of my life and aged into a grandfather. Good thing this was streamed, or I'd look like a sussy hacker. Thanks to whoever gave me the diglet, it was... well utilized. However, it's okay, baby, because we got more babies to fill out the baby army of mine. Route 2 allows us to hatch Glowstone the Shinx, while our gift Pokemon encounter in the Dream Yard is godly in the form of Scyther. Despite Unova having zero returning Pokemon from previous generations, the Metal Kill can still be found in Twist Mountain. I have a new favorite child in Cobweb when we get the chance to evolve her. That's all the eggs we can hatch before it's time to face off with Chili. Magma gets to shine through even against his Lillipup. Bite doesn't deal that much damage to us, and then the Heatwave cleanly knocks the pupper down. Then all that's left is Panseer, whose only attack is Incinerate. Even with workup boosts, the Earful Monkey can't scramble us that well. Super effective Rock Throw after Rock Throw, as well as Yawn to make things easier, brings down Panseer, finishing Chili off for our first Gym Badge. Now is truly the beginning of our stroll across Unova. We hatch Coral the Whalemer on Route 3, Moss the Badu in Wellspring Cave, and Sand the Scraggy from outside of Pinwheel Forest. Moss and Sand were both given guns in the form of Leaf Storm and Drain Punch. Everyone's growing into fine Pokemon, defeating N this time without having to call Child Protective Services, so that's a plus. But Lenora is scary for this point in the game. Her deer is already decently strong with our mostly unevolved squad, and the same can be said for her Watchog who has Retaliate. This attack doubles in power to 140 the turn after a teammate faints, and she gets Stab off of this. Despite this, I thought I could get through the battle with ease thanks to my Fighting-type Scraggy, and I instantly forgot her deer had Intimidate. Listen, I like to be a bit careless when streaming, but even I shouldn't have forgotten Intimidate. Well, can't help it. Due to the attack drop, Drain Punch just barely doesn't KO, leaving Sand with lower defense thanks to Herdier. I want both stat drops gone, so I swap the Moss on Lenora's healing turn before going back to Sand on takedown, which does a ton more damage than I was expecting. A crit would have killed, and now Sand is useless against Herdier. Whoops! We will salvage this somehow. We risk another takedown crit on the way into Glowstone, who can then spark the faint Herdier. Now it's Watchog's turn. We weren't gonna get through this fight without a retaliate kill, so honestly the battle's going about as well as I expected, even with the fumbling. Just like a certain purple man, it's only right to sacrifice a dear loved one as a test of resolve. I'm sorry, Coral. 
Funnily, she survives to retaliate, but the team would really prefer a safe switch. Watch out can hit hard on any of them or put them to sleep with hypnosis, meaning I have to watch Coral go down to another retaliate. Already two viewers' Pokemon killed in the dumbest of ways, but at least Sand makes her comeback. But I really should have used those Chesto Berries Charon gave me. Would have been really helpful against Hypnosis, Retaliate has less base power than Takedown, so we survive with 1 HP remaining. And Sand is tired of being tired. She delivers a Drain Punch to instantly KO Watchog, earning us our second badge from Lenora. One death was what I figured was inevitable, but unfortunately, so am I as this run continues to put more children in harm's way. Route 4 gives us our only encounter before Berg in the form of Anvil the Venipede. She's actually incredible as we begin our battle with Berg. I'll finally be able to perform a classic strategy I've never done ever, both casual, competitive, or challenge runs. We set up Toxic Spikes, armor up with Defense Curl, and then rolling, 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 earning us an easy third gym badge with that fun move combo. As we arrive in Nimbasa City, we get a whole six encounters. First is a... Larvesta. You know, I'd rather have Mimi moves like Final Gambit Diglett than an unusable little guy who won't evolve even with the highest level cap. But at least Lava is cute. She is from the Desert Resort, while the rest of the encounters include Bed the Remoraid at Relic Castle, Glass to Kecleon from Nacreen City, Fossil Encounter, hehe, <laughs> Kelp the Cooler form Shellos from Route 5, Obsidian the Mistrevis from Route 16, who has Memento, I don't trust y'all, and finally Jukebox the Wismer from Lost Lorn Forest. Jukebox was sent by my friend Galactic Attorney who made this challenge possible by creating the special eggs in the special DS so I'd remain blind to what Pokemon I was hatching. So I'll keep Jukebox safe for the most part until the level cap lets her evolve. However, you know what you guys aren't safe from? My shilling of the channel. Really though, subscribing means a lot to help the channel out. Consider it if you're a fan of Nuzlocke challenges, Pokemon in general, or are interested in my childcare services. For the question of the day, what's your most memorable moment playing any Pokemon game? Anyway, we're stacked with encounters now, so let's begin the gym fight against Elisa, who leads with Emolga. We're in for the long haul with Glass. Elisa is known for being annoying with Volt Switch shenanigans, swapping between Pokemon so you can't really finish one off if weakening them with multiple hits. That's the case here as we slash with Glass repeatedly. Glass has great special defense, and her egg move is Recover. With color change, we do guarantee some safety to not get overpowered by the Electric Onslaught, turning into an Electric type whenever hit by Volt Switch. This aids us whenever we need to recover. Elisa is going back and forth between one specific Amolga and her Zebstrika, and we last long enough to waste one of her Hyper Potions. By the end of it all, we finish off her first Emolga with a final slash and have Zebstrika very low, at the cost of Emolga static paralyzing Glass. A priority Shadow Sneak then frustratingly puts her into range to heal Zebstrika again. I had an Orin Berry equipped instead of a Cherry Berry, so I definitely deserve the many turns lost to Paralysis. We have to switch out after getting Zebstrika to less than half again. Going into Glowstone, she doesn't have Intimidate, instead, Rivalry. Really great in this opposite gender scenario. But the Zebra can't damage her too much, allowing two bites to finish her off. Last is the second Emolga, who I swap Obsidian in on Quick Attack. I'm trying to bait Pursuit so I can get a free switch to someone else, which we can survive even a crit. However, Elisa instead aerial aces as Jukebox makes her debut already doing poorly and keeping her away from danger. I swap back into Obsidian on Volt Switch. Imalga then lands an Aerial Ace to put us low, but we counter back with Confuse Ray. And since Lisa is dumb, I know it can somewhat safely go into Glowstone, as Imalga hits himself in Confusion. The rat does so again, letting us nail a Spark. While Imalga does break through eventually, it's too late, as one more spark takes out Elisa's final Pokemon for our fourth badge. Definitely could have played that way better with Cherry Berries, but it's okay, no deaths happened. Time to head to Drift Vale for the banging music! Well, after entering my magma into a beauty pageant, a fate worse than death. And man, just look at her, she's so funny since she can't hold or put on anything besides headwear, which should, should be burning, I don't know how that works, but she's doing her best. As for traveling the Drift Vale, after we fight Chirin, Child Protective Service member Alder tested my skill in keeping kids safe, without letting me switch up my party. So I'm forced to enter a double battle with Chirin against two preschoolers, both with her deer. One of them sets up a workup, while Sans Drain Punch finishes the other and heals us up to where the other shouldn't kill. I also can't swap out on a boost to takedown, so unless this doggo both aims for Sand and lands a crit, we'll be okay. We win the battle and then escape from the scene of the crime. Hey hey, look! More eggs to hatch! 
On the bridge that looks like a Charizard in the region with no Charizard, we get a Sigilith, a Twitch chatter redeemed to name her. As someone who doesn't play Minecraft, when they said waxed lightly cobblestone, I just went with it and keyboard mashed to fit the name. I was later told that's not a block and they mistook it for copper. But it's okay, there's no mistakes when naming a child. We also hatch Lapis the Dratini at the Cold Storage, another Pokemon who can't fully evolve, thanks guys, and Hay Bale the Stunfisk on Route 6. Route 6 is also where I may find a shiny stone to evolve Moss into Roserade. However, while getting to it, I accidentally run into Scientist Ron and his single Deerling. Aw, little Deerling wants to play. Well, Moss's grass attack should be more than fine. Except I forgot Deerling has Sap Zipper, raising his attack on the same turn Ron used an X attack. This guy just went plus two in one turn for free. He's too powerful, and I am begging, please, please don't kill a Pokemon in another completely stupid way. But Faint Attack also gets a crit as Lapis switches in. Extreme Speed deals exactly half, so it's likely a roll for the KO. One more Faint Attack will end it, but I noticed Dragon Rage should guarantee the KO. Until I gaslit myself into thinking Lapis was naturally faster since I had just gone first with priority earlier, causing Deerling to take down Lapis. This is a good example of how extreme panic, especially when fast speed is enabled in your special console, can cause recklessness with fatal results. I wasn't gonna get a Dragonite because level caps, but that doesn't make this any less stupid of me. Let's mindlessly take out our anger on Clay, shall we? With our newly evolved Moss, she wrecks his Crocorock instantly with Giga Drain, bringing out Excadrill. Another Giga Drain does over half, while Bulldoze does a similar amount, which would obviously have KO'd if it crit. Who needs damage calcs when you could just not be crit? I switch to Kelp on another Bulldoze, who can take a second one and take out Excadrill with a Water Pulse the following turn. Last is Palpatoad, who I let Bed handle with two Scalds since the Toad can't do much. Why did I not cheat Scald to Kelp? I forgot. Making it the Chargestone Cave, N is even easier than all the fights before with our huge variety of Pokemon, but at this point, I am slowly realizing his view might be correct when it comes to Nuzlocks. Pokemon dying when they lose in battle? Yeah, I, I would be a bit worried too. Main Protagonist Syndrome still says I'm right, so we'll be facing Skyla soon. We hatch Cake the Vulpix in Chargestone Cave, Prismarine the Weasel on Route 7, and Pumpkin the Chikorita in Celestial Tower, who is also boasting a gun in Leaf Storm. As for Skyla, rivalry on Glowstone will actually be brutal for her. All she can hope for are Heart Stamp flinches, but it doesn't happen. Glowstone knocks all of her flying type Pokemon out of the sky with one spark a piece for an incredibly easy 6th gym badge. She really should have attacked with Unpheasant and Swana to prevent this, but who cares? We are heading off to Twist Mountain. For our battle with Charon, I taught Thief to a few Pokemon to yoink the scope lens on his Unpheasant and leftovers on Embor. The leftovers especially would be nice to have, but then after the battle I just didn't have them? The game gave me hope to get rad items before crushing my heart. We'll return the crushing by breaking the ice types of Icerus Gym after getting our final encounters of the run. Sadly, I didn't receive enough eggs for the rest of the areas, but that's alright. We have plenty of Pokemon already. These final mons are Grass to Pedalil in Twist Mountain, Concrete the Totodile in Icerus City, Wool the Mareep on Route 8, Piston the Trubbish at Dragon Spiral Tower's entrance, and Tuff the Spoink in the Moor of Icerus. People really want me to misclick in this run, since Petalil has Healing Wish, and Trubbish has Self-Destruct to speedrun L's. Maybe you all are more savage than I am with my Pokemon. But that's a lie, because I'm becoming more savage at the fact that my own submission, Spoink, was the final one hatched. We also finally have Scizor and Meg Cargo, but not Exploud. One level off the level cap, you poor cacophonic gremlin. Anyway, Bryson should be a breeze, or in this case, a heat wave. Remember to always leave the air conditioning on on a hot day. But Bryson won't be getting that option as we set up a shell smash with Magma after vanillish waste time using Acid Armor. We're finally still slower, but at this point, Magma is being power crept by other Pokemon. She's going big, or she's going six feet under as we shell smash once more after taking a mirror shot. And now, it's a clean, deathless sweep. Vanillish melts away, Bear Tick regrets coming out of hibernation, and Cryogono becomes a masked puddle wishing for the sweet release of evaporation. No misses earn us our 7th gym badge from Bryson. With that, the story intensifies, as have my bonds with my remaining Pokemon. There's a lot to do before fighting Iris. 
None of it's a problem as we make our way to her with all of these trainers in her gym. Oh my. I would argue most of these Drodagon and Dragon Dancing Fracture are scarier than Iris's team, since they're not hindered by negative priority dragon attacks. But man, there's also just a ton of them. It gets so scary that I have to rely on Cobweb for a lot of them. And on the last possible trainer, she overlevels. There goes the Dragon Resist. We still have a few options like Dragon Dance for Alligator. I simply feel less comfortable that we won't lose someone. Let's see as our fight with Iris starts up. I told myself, when in doubt, roll out. Yep, we're performing that strat again. Iris uses Dragon Dance a ton, giving Anvil the opportunity to defense curl and begin a double damage rollout. On the second turn, we miss it. Gonna take Iris out the hard way. I do get lucky as she goes for a fourth Dragon Dance, allowing a Steamroller to come through. It looks to be a range for a knockout, so I go for another attack, knowing Dragon Tail will make Anvil attack first. Unfortunately, Fracture hangs on in the red, allowing a plus four Dragon Tail to actually not KO Anvil, huh? Based on the HP, probably wasn't even a range. Anvil just has the defenses of an actual Anvil. This drags in Moss, who can then KO Fracture with Sludge Bomb after Iris heals. See what I mean by the gym trainers being tougher in some aspects? I would have already lost if I let them do Dragon Dance four times. Next up is Drudagon. Moss first sets up a layer of Toxic Spikes as backup for dealing with Haxorus. Then Iris is dumb and goes for a Resisted Revenge. We lay more Toxic Spikes as Drudagon uses Revenge again. Now we Giga Drain to heal up a bit and possibly get out of range of a crit Dragon Tail. We don't, but it doesn't crit because I need an excuse to be reckless. Piston is out now and Toxic Drudagon during another revenge. Then we use a few turns to Sludge Bomb and bring Drudagon low. When we ourselves are low, we swap to Prismarine on a missed Dragon Tail. Works for me. Crunch can then finish Drudagon off, leaving Haxorus for last. An Ice Fang connects with Haxorus, but it's 3 hit KO territory as Haxorus uses Dragon Dance. However, I know Iris loves spamming Dragon Dance. I bet all my biscuits that she'd go for it again, and I was 100% correct. I always am. Ice Fang plus Toxic Damage is enough to faint Haxorus, winning us the battle for our final gym badge. I'm feeling good that it's been four whole gyms without an incident. Just vibing about, talking with the chat as we make our way to Victory Road, running into numerous trainers along the way. It's the end of the adventure, what could possibly go wrong besides running into veteran Tiffany and her BHM. Having my Psychic Week Moss definitely isn't a good start to this, and swapping Concrete only for her to take over half from a Psychic immediately made me realize I wasn't gonna have a good time. So I instantly get off a crunch for some damage, and she falls to an energy ball. So this is my squad of Pokemon ready to challenge the Elite Four and make our way to N. Seems dirty to still use them, but it's the same logic as Team Plasma has had all this time for why they use their Pokemon. Let's begin our final battles. We begin the Elite Four facing off with Caitlyn first. I actually have plans for these battles, so hopefully that's shown better from here on out. Hitting hard and fast, a Ghost Gem Shadow Ball allows Obsidian to take out her lead Reuniclus in a single hit. Then comes Musharna. We might bait Shadow Ball, so we switch to Jukebox. A Black Glass's boosted crunch does over half. She opts for Reflect, meaning we have to stall it out before attacking to be safe. Using Protect, and swapping to Wax Lightly Cobblestone, or Wix Cobblestone, we can handle Psychics, and then switch back to Jukebox on Shadow Ball, until Reflect wears off, ending in one final crunch to take Musharna out. Third up is Sigilith, who Obsidian can switch into to tank a Psychic. Then one Shadow Ball is enough to Oko her with ease. Last up is Gothitelle. Gothitelle should go for either Shadow Ball or Calm Mind. She does the latter as we get Cobweb in safely, allowing a Bug Gem boosted X Scissor to freely one-shot Gothitelle. This wins us our first Elite Four battle. And the funny thing about this Elite Four is that if you have something for Caitlyn, you generally have something for Chantal, who leads with Cofagrigus. Obsidian is out first once more, and just like with Reuniclus, a Ghost Gem Shadow Ball is easily capable of devastating Cofagrigus. Up comes Jellicent, whose obvious Shadow Ball is absorbed by Jukebox. 81% of the time, a Dark Gem Crunch O codes, but we can live a hit anyway. We do end up getting that roll for the knockout, bringing in Golurk third. This is where the PP stall begins, as Chantal has no free will for herself and can be easily read. She will always Brick Break or Earthquake Jukebox, which Obsidian is immune to. Meanwhile, she'll bait Shadow Punch for Jukebox to come in on. Luckily, I don't have to waste my time for too long as she uses Curse to cut her HP in half. We want Jukebox in for what's next, so she's the one to finish off Golurk with Crunch. Last is Chandelure, where we finally have to play a bit risky. A Fire Blast crit has about a 50% chance to Oko Prismarine the Floatzel. She's that frail, but it's also the only way for her to get in to drown Shandy with a Water Gem boosted Surf. 
A crit burn lets even lesser rolls result in a death, but there's nothing to worry about with Prismarine Survival. Which burns. Not like it matters for the special water attack, though a crit would have killed. It's whatever. Chantal is defeated. Third up is Grimsley and his Dark Types. He leads with his Scrafty as we go with Moss, who can live any attack even if it crits. This lets us Sludge Bomb for over half of Scrafty's health, which also poisons. This isn't meaningless, due to the fact that Grimsley will waste a full restore now. It's just nice to have their resources wasted. Two more Sludge Bombs finish Scrafty off. Lyperd will be second, who can be handled by Prismarine. She lives a fake out on the way in before shattering every bone in Lyperd's fragile, feline body with Brick Break. Crocodile is up third now, but with a water gem, Surf is too much for the croc as she succumbs to the waves. This leaves Bisharp for last, who has zero attacks that threaten Cobweb. Night Slash and Aerial Ace mean nothing compared to a quadruple super effective Brick Break, Okoing Bisharp. That's another Elite Four member defeated, leaving Marshall for last. This battle I did last due to potential randomness from his lead throw. Moss sets up some Toxic Spikes to deal with Sox Sturdy in the back, and then Throw misses a Stone Edge. This is actually what I was referring to when I mentioned randomness. We'll need to waste all five of Throw's Stone Edges to prepare for a sweep. While he'll sometimes use other attacks like Bulldoze, Protect can help stall it out, as well as swapping over to Cobweb who can tank everything and heal back up with Rest. We can also Bullet Punch once just to ensure a later KO move. Eventually, Throw runs out of Stone Edges, giving us the opportunity to bring in Wixenkumpstun on a quad-resisted Storm Throw. Now all we have to do is click Psychic four times, making sure to protect the turn to damage Sock and break Sturdy thanks to Poison. All four of Marshall's Pokémon faint, granting us a pretty easy win all things considered. That's the last of the Elite Four. Just in case, I upped the level cap to 52. This point in the game is always awkward for Nuzlocke, but I think it's fair since we can also swap out Pokémon with the PC and even leave and return to the League without having to refight the Elite Four. We'll be swapping out Obsidian, Jukebox, and Moss for Kelp, Hay Bale, and Pumpkin and knows I've learned throughout this journey the importance of Pokemon care and Minecraft block names. Let's begin our duel with Team Plasma's King. N leads with his mighty Reshiram as Kelp comes to help. From my knowledge, N is programmed to always Fusion Flare, which we resist. We can then begin a Dig, which strikes for over half Reshiram's health the next turn. An Extrasensory causes a Flinch. That's one turn wasted. Kelp lives another Fusion Flare, allowing her to dig a hole and finish the Legendary Dragon off. Up second is supposedly Kling Clang, but it could just as easily be Zoroark causing an illusion. I was expecting Vanillux, to be honest. Wasn't sure if the AI would include recharge moves when deciding what the highest power attack they have is, in this case Hyper Beam. That logic does cross off the potential Zoroark, so after some thinking, I swap over the Hay Bale on a Hyper Beam, meaning this is Kling Clang. Hay Bale has a lot of HP and is surprisingly tanky. It takes a few turns for a combination of Thunderbolts and Scald to stop those gears in their tracks. Third up is Vanillux. Barring a potential freeze, this is simple. Cobweb comes in, actually avoids the Blizzard outright, and then a Steel Gem boosted Bullet Punch, along with Technician, clobbers that Ice Cream Cone. This means Zoroark is up next. He threatens with Flamethrower, so that's a swap over to Floatzel, who gets crit and leaves her just over half health. Then with one super effective Brick Break, that fox is taken down. Or I'm outfoxed. Well, that's straight up dire. Should have had a fighting gem and not a water gem as a backup measure since I totally forgot to calc this. Losing Prismarine sucks for when we have to fight Getsus. Let's move on with Zorok's demise via two bullet punches after N's attempt to heal. Fifth out is Caracosta. I swap into Pumpkin, whose more defensive profile is fantastic for these battles. She lives a Stone Edge, and is then able to fire off a Grass Knot that puts Caracosta down to his Sturdy, taking yet another Stone Edge afterward. I don't want Pumpkin out for Archaeops though, so I spend a few turns healing up with Synthesis to stall his remaining Stone Edges. Twice in one endgame, how about that? This gives us a much safer switch back to Cobweb on a Crunch before bringing down Caracosta with Bullet Punch. This leaves the aforementioned Archaeops left who succumbs to a single super effective bullet punch. This means we've proven our worth to N, but as I had lied to myself about what Pokemon mean to me, Getsus has been lying and manipulating N, all so that Getsus may rule Unova. Perhaps that means N and I are both wrong. The only way we'll come to an agreement is to take down his supposed father and bring him to justice. Our final bout versus Getsus starts off with his Kofagrigus against Kelp. I had no time to arrange my party, meaning I have to spend a turn switching to Cobweb, but Getsus just goes for Protect. We've got a few goals here as we're being pelted by Shadow Balls. 
first, set up an agility for later. Then, we're gonna whittle Kafagrigus down to the red intentionally to force Getsus to use his one full restore. Both of these go off without a hitch, though I was careful to put him low again in case he had a second full restore. The onslaught of night slashes and bullet punches reburies that sarcophagus. Now here comes Hydreigon, who is most likely gonna fire blast. The plan was always to sack Cobweb here, but Prismarine's job was then to outspeed and finish Hydreigon off. I'll find a way though. Agility allows us to be faster, nailing an X scissor that brings Hydreigon very low. And then Hydreigon misses a focus blast. Plot armor? At its finest, let's go. Our HP was low enough to where it was random between Fire Blast and Focus Blast. To the AI, accuracy means nothing to them. It just so happens that the stupid dragon chose the lesser accurate attack, leading to Hydreigon's defeat with a second X Scissor. E Electros is up third with Flamethrower, and I realize I probably want Cobweb for later. We swap over the Kelp to tank the fire attack, and after taking a crunch the next turn, we can start firing off Waterfalls. Two more will do it, but we are forced to take a crunch that lowers our defense as we resto Chesto back to full. Getsis remembers Acrobatics is more powerful and uses it for brutal damage as we land another Waterfall. But then Getsis forgets again? Attacking with Crunch. Could have gone for the Crit Acrobatics, though I much prefer the route of Electros going down to a final Waterfall without worry. Oh, also, Kelp finally learns Recover. Very cool, but very too late as Bufalon comes out. My original plan would have had Wuxl Cobblestone do as much damage as possible with a Psychic Gem Boosted Psychic, though with her already out, obviously. I decide she can't do much. Plus, she has a chance to live a reckless head charge anyway, so I swap into her. Then Wuxlstone gets one shot by head charge, meaning that was for nothing. Probably should have sacked Kelp before attempting this, but thanks for the recoil damage, buddy. Kelp ain't complaining about not dying, I will say. Pumpkin will avenge the fallen. She's barely taking enough to live a critical hit head charge, granting us time to toxic the buffalo and stall many a turn with synthesis. When Bufflant is finally low from poison, a grass knot can clutch that KO. And actually, having Pumpkin out is fantastic here. She baits out Seismitoad, since he has Sludge Wave. The problem for him, though, is that it's still incredibly weak against Pumpkin, allowing us to heal a bit with Synthesis. We are also equipped with a Pekka Berry for a potential poison, but Seismitoad simply sets up Brain Dance. Guess we won't even be damaged as he goes down to Grass Knot. Texas's last Pokemon is his powerful Bisharp. We're at full HP and can afford to spend a few turns to deal damage. Grass Knot deals about a fourth of his health, though Night Slash deals a similar amount, probably slightly more. On the second Grass Knot turn, Getsis remembers he has a super effective X Scissor. It deals a good chunk more. I then proceed to forget Rain is still up, lowering the effectiveness of my recovery with Synthesis. To be absolutely safe that nothing goes wrong, it's better for Pumpkin to go down fighting. But we should go off with a bang. It's our final chance for the baby to use her gun. And it misses. <laughs> Eh, you know what? I, I, I'm not even mad. It, it's not even, we're not even in danger. I just find that hilarious. <laughs> Half our team remains. Kelp and Cobweb aren't looking too well, meaning Hey Bale is here to say hey and bail us out. She's very tanky to the point where Night Slash only deals a fourth, with this Thunderbolt putting Bisharp in the red. One more attack will do it, but it wouldn't be a Jukum Nuzlocke without the potential Ultra Throw. I bet with all my heart that Getsis was gonna whip out the secret full restore. So guess what egg move Haybale had that would be perfect in such a scenario? Yeah, no in-between when I'm super smart or super hopeless to leave to do anything on my own. I possibly might have thrown the entire run if we get crit next turn. The Night Slash comes through... And we're holding on at 6 HP. To play absolutely safe after absolutely not playing safe the turn prior, we Resto Chesto up back to full HP. After tanking one last Night Slash, Hey Bale the Stunfisk won't be having any more mercy on Getsus' Bisharp, shocking it with Thunderbolt to KO him. That is his final Pokemon. This wins us both the battle and the whole run, baby! And N is freed from the shackles of an actual toxic parental figure. With that, N and myself part ways. Oh my god, I'm so bad at Pokemon. <laughs> that definitely wasn't the most skilled Nuzlocke out there, but I felt the recklessness was enjoyable for what the run was about. Viewers thinking they can be funny sending in weird and cool Pokemon, only for me to do mindless plays. Losing those Pokemon just seems fitting. While my plans didn't entirely work out near the end, trying to figure out what to do after something unfortunate, like the Prismarine incident, is actually pretty fun. Thinking on the fly is something I know I'm pretty decent at, 
unless I'm feeling myself a bit too much, like with the paint split moment. <laughs> Cobweb's x scissor would have dealt the damage needed, but I'm only mentioning it here because I needed the drama. Also, if people don't watch this end part of the video and assumed I was just completely garbage and idiotic for making the play, fair enough, honestly. Appreciate y'all for watching. I'll see you next time for more non-socks and general Pokemon content.